Oh, can you hear me? Yay! <laughs> All right. Okay, we got it. Oh, look at that. I love that. <laughs> to meet the biz <laughs> yeah. okay i'm very excited today because um i mean this i met this man on the set of deadwood the movie and i was there for about nine of the days and he just he has you know you meet people and they just glow they has have this loving essence about them he has a heart of gold a loving and beyond talented man. I mean, his list of films and, and TV shows, I mean, Scream, it's something about Mary, of course, Deadwood, um, The Last of Us, Preacher, Bates Motel, American Horror Story, uh, Mandalorian, to Helen Back. I could keep on going and going and going. I just say, this man is amazing, a brilliant actor. And here he is, W. Earl Brown. Hello. Thanks for having me. Hello. Thank you for being here. Mm. So, how you doing? I'm doing good I'm for an early morning. I've had a <laughs> cup of coffee, so. I know. I actually, I actually woke up early this morning. I woke up before the sun came up. So <laughs> that's an oddity. Did it just happen? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, my yeah. wife was up early, so I followed suit. Okay, okay. So I, I want to start. W. Earl Brown, where does the W come from? Uh, my name is William Earl Brown, but I was called Earl my whole life. I said it was a parental curse because my father was William Eddie Brown, goes by Eddie. So um, uh, when I went to join the union, there was already an Earl Brown. There was already a William Brown. So, and I was on a must join, like I had to be at work at one o'clock on set and I had to have my union card that morning because I'd already taft Hartley, uh, you know, the way it works getting in the union. Yeah. So I'm standing there and she goes, I'm sorry, you can't be Earl Brown. Uh, uh, okay, um, William Brown. I'm sorry, there's a William Brown. So I remembered the name W. Earl Brown from an Elvis Presley record because right. he was an arranger and songwriter. Um, he did, he wrote Elvis's song "If I Can Dream" because he was the musical director for that Elvis special that they dramatized in the recent Elvis film. So I said, "Okay, I'll be uh, W. Earl Brown." So I became W. Earl Brown. Years later, because I I play music too, yeah. um, I had to join the songwriter. We had a song in a movie, and I had to join the songwriters uh, association ASCAP, yeah. and where where W. Earl Brown had been represented. So. As a songwriter, I'm William Earl Brown, but as an actor and writer, I'm W Earl. So oh. that's a very long answer to a short question, but that's where no, the W I love comes it. from. Did they? Did somebody already take a W Earl in music, or you wanted the full William? No, well, well, there was already W Earl Brown. That the the guy that I took my name from. Oh right. Was already, yeah, he was an established musician and songwriter, and he was a very active arranger, mostly television work in the 60s and, and 70s. Mm -hmm. uh, Walt, Walter Earl was his name. I never met him. Yeah. Um, he only passed. Yeah. And within the last decade, he's passed. But, you know, when I was out here, and I, I'd occasionally run into people who knew him, but I never met the man. The 60s, I love the 60s and 70s. Those, those were part of, I mean, I would love the 60s because I was born then, but um, 
Talking about early movies, do you remember <laughs> your first film or TV show that you went, oh, ooh, I love this. Oh, yeah. I Well, um, the uh, one big epiphany for me, I was four years old. Uh, my mother, well, my mother's still around. She still remains a big music fan. I went to my first concert, and it was the Porter Wagner Show with Dolly Parton. Oh, and, Dolly had just joined the TV show. Well, we watched the Porter Wagner show every week. I grew up down south. Yeah. And um, so it was my first time seeing people in person that I watched on television. And I remember having this thought, because I was four years old, thinking, oh, my God, they're, they're real. They're <laughs> really people. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't know what I thought um, those people in the, in the box were before that. But, uh, but I had that. And then in high school, the the big the first movie I remember going to see, my parents took me because they wanted to see it. Now I'd already seen some films, but I don't you know kid films. Yeah. But I remember going to see Bonnie and Clyde, and my mother kept covering my eyes because of all the violence and sex in it. Which you know at that period that was a really out there movie. Oh yeah. Um, but uh, the movies that made me want to do this were my freshman year of high school. They came out either right before or right after. And right. they were Star Wars, Animal House, and Halloween. Those were the big three. So those and are I, the ones that made, made me sit there in a the theater and go, oh my God, I want to I want to be a part of that. So and you and you have become a part of that. So mm -hmm. I mean like Halloween, Scream and uh, but no am am I was I reading something wrong that you didn't start acting until college? Uh, yeah, when we didn't have a theater department, they started a community theater when I was like 13 years old. It's still there, still active. Right. I was never a part of it. I was never recruited to be. And, and I, you know, we lived out in the county. I didn't live in town. We lived 12 miles out in the farmlands. And, you know, just farm kids didn't do that kind of stuff. Or so I thought. Mm -hmm. um, so I was never involved. We had a very active speech and debate team, forensics competition in high school. When I say we, my wife, that's where I met my wife. We're, we've been together since high Well, she was in high school. I had graduated at that point yeah. when we first went on a date. But um, we had this incredible teacher who, who really instilled in us a, a work ethic and allowed us to dream. And Larry said, you know, Mr. England, he said, you can be anything you want to be. There's nothing wrong in life. If you choose to stay here and be a farmer and work, that's admirable. But don't think that you're you're tied to that. You're capable of anything. And then in my group of friends, uh, Danny is the assistant general manager of Jack Daniels. Kim worked for Oracle for years and, and he started his own company. Um, and uh, Keith runs the websites for the state of Alabama. Uh, Mike is a senior executive with United Healthcare in Boston. Uh, Lanessa works for some big bank out of Dallas. So the moral of that is that we were all blue collar farm kids yeah. and we've had a, a inordinate amount of career success. Um, so I, I think we all sort of, you know, fed off of one another. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it, it is amazing how you could still keep in touch with those people and, and, and go oh, after yeah. your dreams. And, and now did your, did your family, did your mom and dad, once you became an actor, there was, uh, or were they always supportive of you or? Well, um, they were always supportive of me, but you know, I, 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 I did things that they didn't think was possible, you know? Right. Um, I, I, there was a lot of reticence when I decided I'm going to move to Chicago and I'm going to do this the summer of 1985. I drove every weekend to Chicago. It was an 840 mile round trip. I drove up there and took classes at the second city with a guy named Don DiPolo. I did it for six weeks. As it was a six week class, summer of 85, yeah. 420 up, 420 back. So I had done that. And that's when I realized like, oh, I, I, I can play at a bigger league. I can do this. Yeah. So the next year I auditioned and got into the Goodman School of Drama to their graduate program. Right. Uh, the theater school DePaul is what DePaul. they they were part of DePaul University. Um, so I decided to do that. And, you know, it was a private school. I had gone. I was the first in my family to even go to college and going to Murray State, which was a state school right there where I'm from. Yeah. You know, it was it was inexpensive. So I, I went to 
to Chicago to go to a private school and, um, you know, signing those student loans just scared the hell out of me so, because it was more money than, than, you know, I thought possible. And now, you know, I, I look at it and it's, it, it's really a drop in the bucket, but, but yeah, it was a scary time. And, uh, my mom always supported me, but they, they, I don't think they really thought that it was possible that I could achieve it. But you um, went after your dream. Yep. Yeah. And yep. now your first job on a film was not as an actor, but as a dialogue yep. coach. Yeah. I, um, I had auditioned for the movie Backdraft. Yeah. And it, um, I, I, when I got out of school, I mean, it was, hell, I auditioned for everything in Chicago, every little upstart theater, anything that I could go get in to read, I was there. Yeah. And it took almost a year to really get the ball rolling to start getting theater gigs. Um, and then I always, cause I wanted to be a movie and TV because I knew that's how I could make a living. Yeah. You know, I could make a comfortable living there. So um, long story short, but I, I get into audition for backdraft yeah. and there was a character at the very beginning of the movie. It was one big scene. He's a bartender and they didn't know if they were going to make him Billy Baldwin was starring in the movie. If yeah. they were going to make him Billy's contemporary, like a guy he grew up in the neighborhood with or somebody that had been Billy's dad's age. So I was basically the guy who was going to be the young guy. Right. So I'm waiting to meet Ron Howard and I could hear the people. And I heard Ron say, you know, there's a very distinct Chicago dialect. Uh, could you could you do that? So I hear it. So from the time I walk in a door, I put on this really hard Southsider dialect. Like, you know, so we do the whole thing. We do the audition. Ronnie says, uh, so um, you're obviously you're 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 from here. I said, well, actually, no, I'm not. <laughs> You're not. And I said, no, I um, just, you know, my my uncle did live up here and worked as a steel worker yeah. when I was young. Um, but no, I just kind of picked up the the uh, the dialect. So that's how I got hired to coach dialect on the film. And and then I kept bug because I needed my SAG card. And they all played basketball. Well, I made arrangements because I played ball twice a week at DePaul at the practice gym. So I made arrangements with the DePaul athletic department that on Sunday mornings, the movie crew could come and play ball. So I got to know them on the basketball court and I kept bugging them. Like, I need my SAG card, dude. I need my SAG card. If I make this jumper, you got to get me my SAG card. Well, they did. Um, so, um, so yeah, yeah have, that's, you thought that's, of, have you thought of writing a book? I'm, I'm just flowing I'm, with you. I'm, I'm have been working on these stories for about a year. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Oh, wonderful. I just so visually see that. And uh, yeah, I, 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 there's so much. I was going through everything. And of course, I know you personally. We just watched, and if you could believe this, I've known Jerry Jewell. By the way, when I mention the word name Jerry Jewell, what comes to your mind? Oh, facts of life. Yeah. You've noticed since then? Well, no, I, I knew Jerry in, in 2006. She emailed me and she said, I see that you're doing classes and you're doing one with Corey Allen and I would love to join. And I went, uh, uh, of course. So I opened the door and there was this instant connection and we've been friends ever since. Um, and she, she, you know, I, 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 I hadn't seen Deadwood. In fact, when I was on the set, I think I saw one episode with her. So this last month, we watched, my brother and I watched the whole, the whole thing. I was like, oh. and at first I didn't, I couldn't find you. And then, I, <laughs> because you look, you know, the long hair and this and that. And I was like, oh my God, it just shows. I mean, I was, I was looking at all this and I, you, you become your characters. You're so, you're so, I mean, I mean, you started what with Wes Craven, is this correct? Yeah, Wes was the first when I came out here. Yeah. Um, I, I'd kind of hit the glass ceiling in Chicago. I had seven or eight TV film credits to my name. Yeah. Um, and I had worked, well, I did a, an action film called Excessive Force, and I was the bad guy. It was Burt Young was the main bad guy, and I was his renegade son. Yeah. And they paid me, and it was a, Lions, or a, a, a new line movie. There was a $6 million budget, which was 
small budget, but you know, it was 1991. Um, well, they paid me scale to be a lead role. And I knew this is the glass ceiling. If I stay here in movies, you know, this is the best I can hope for. Cause they would have hired somebody. They actually had a pretty well-known star that they wanted to play that role. Right. William Forsyth, whose career was hot at the time, but they couldn't afford him. They couldn't afford to pay him what he made. So they hired me. Well, I knew instinctively, all right, this is as good as it gets if I stay here. So I came out and tried out pilot season um, the next February and I got a pilot. I'd been here a couple of weeks and I got a pilot and I, they flew me to New Orleans to shoot this TV pilot. So then I come back here and I got a TV movie and I called my wife and I said, we got to move out here because this is this is easy. So I shot the TV movie. We moved that summer. And then suddenly nothing, crickets. Uh, so, you know, I, I was no longer the Chicago theater guy from out of town. I was just another unemployed actor. Mm. Well, the casting director who did the TV pilot, Gary Zuckerbrod, uh, was doing, I got a call. I said, Gary Zuckerbrod wants to see you. He's doing this new Wes Craven. Um, and it was Wes Craven's new nightmare. And that's how I got to know Wes. And he was the first like marquee name yeah. That night, because I, I have one scene. It's a pretty decent scene. There's something to play. Yeah. And we finish it like three or four in the morning, night shoot, right? And there's a knock on my honey wagon door. Oh, and it's Wes. And he said, I am so glad Gary Gary pushed me to hire you because I didn't know you at all. And I, I, that was excellent. I really, we're going to work together again. So he did, I did. And, you know, two movies after that, I because I did Vampire in Brooklyn. Right. Um, and then I kept pressing my agent to get my said, Wes Craven likes me. you got to get me in on this movie because I told him what he said. Right. And, well, it was late. And the only thing where there was one, it was a one line part, like one line. Yeah. So I get in the door, I go to audition and I'm in the Roddenberry building at Paramount. And I remember as I walked through the door, Wes turned to his a producer went, oh my God, why didn't we have him here earlier? Oh. So that's what I knew. Like, oh, and then Wes said, Earl, I am so embarrassed. There's no need for you to read this. I, I this is below you, but I, if you want to do this, well, then an actor got sick, unfortunately, it, who had a bigger role, had a you know, yeah. not a not a huge role, but significantly bigger. Right. So Wes put me in that part. Um, I got a call said, Wes is moving you up. You're going to play officer. He's a canine officer. I forget the character name. So, uh, that night he gave me his phone number yeah. when we, we finished, he goes, you got to stay in touch with me. Um, because I, I want to do something that gives you. So then screen came up next scary movie. It was originally called. Yeah. Um, they changed the name right before we released it. But, yeah. Uh, yep. I, you, uh... I'm I'm pausing here for a moment because I'm taking you in and you're so you're so real you're so and you're so I mean it makes me I a little tear up just because you, you're real and you're successful and there's no schmaltz with you I have to say I'm I'm jumping here in question land but one of my favorite parts of just being on the set, and I was just there, I wasn't doing any major stuff except, you know, being being an assistant on on Deadwood be, just because of Jerry and and. But one of my favorite memories of being on the set was sitting there, waiting for people to go on the set, and you were singing and playing your guitar and your music. And then I remember that you were you were playing down the street in Hollywood and it was just it just flows out of you. The love that you have um, in life. Well, so. uh, Deadwood was a special circumstance for all of us. Um, I think we all knew that we when we were making it, that we had something that no one had ever really seen before. Yeah. And and um, the way it it stopped. I say it, the show didn't end, the show stopped. And there's a difference between those two things. Yeah. You know, we were cut off at the knees. We had no idea that that was going to be. So there was always a, an open wound. Um, so when we got, it wasn't the same. I, I, and I, I knew it wasn't going to be the same when we got to come back to do the film. Yeah. You know, life moves on and it's a different time period. And, and um, 
you know, David's health was, was taking a turn for the worse. And, but, but to be back in that space with those people allowed us to say hello and goodbye to each other. Mm. So a lot of that, you know, and through that show, I befriended so many musicians, like well-known. I don't know if you were there the day Jason Isbell was there for the wedding yes. scene. Yeah. I mean, we we had a free Jason Isbell because Jason, you know, he fills up the Greek theater on his own. He can do two nights at the Greek. So, you know, he's pretty well-known. Um, and Jason, absolutely. I, I met him when we were doing the show. Yeah. Back when he was unknown, he had just joined the band, the Drive-By Truckers. And we kind of loosely stayed in touch over the years as his star, you know, based on his pure talent, just ascended. So, yeah, it was a, it was, it was special. The love was especially flowing that time because I was incredibly full of gratitude to uh, to be back there. Because I, I, it, it was like this nagging scab that I could not stop picking at for a decade. Yeah. You know, and and to be back there allowed me to to let go, to say, all right, this is, we've had this moment, and now we move on from this story. Yeah. So uh, so no, it was a special time, and I'm glad you could be there to 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 see it. I, it was it 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 was such a blessing to be there with Jerry, and then and 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 then after seeing the show this last month, and then watching the film again, I was like. Oh, I mean, it's it's now in my top favorite shows of all time, and I see yeah. why there were so many fans. And I was like, oh, "Wait, I know I want more." It's mm -hmm. like it, it. Sometimes Hollywood doesn't make sense, does it? <laughs> well, yeah, no, it doesn't. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I can I can give you many instances of no. I yeah. I naively thought at, just as a business as a career, because Wes Craven. I, I didn't know when Scream came out, I had billing on it, like at the front of the movie, my name and my picture, you know, along with ever Drew Barrymore. And, and I didn't even realize at the time that that was a thing, that that career-wise meant something, yeah. you know? And Wes included me on everything. Mm -hmm. um, so I always thought, well, that's, that's the way things happen. Yeah. You know, you do special work and if it does well, special things happen. Well, then two years later, you know, there's something about Mary exploded. It was huge, huge yeah. hit. And I was completely frozen out of everything. Um, and that was the first, like, it hurt my feelings. And uh, I just wanted to go to the party, but I wasn't invited to a single party. Um, and then, so that was the first big showbiz, like, blow to my ego and my spirit. Um, and it it's just continued, you know. There's it's you just gotta grow a tough skin and try not to take it personally. Yeah. What what suggestions do you have for actors on how to continue to be strong within yourself uh, in business? I don't know that there's any cut and tried method to it. Um, you just have to get used to um, rejection. And and to to be an artist, to be a genuine artist, you got to open your soul, you know, and 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 it, that that you got to let that energy flow through you, and you have to be open. Um, and unfortunately, you know, you get far more rejection than you get um, um, positive reaction, and and get it. So you just have to grow a tough skin and get used to that. And you know, I've been I I produced a movie. Um, in 2009, we shot it. We sold it to Sony. It was released in 2011. I, I wrote it. I adapted this book and then I raised the money with the director. We partnered on it, producing it. So, you know, I've sat on the other side of the table in, in casting Yeah. and, and I've seen, you know, um, there, there, there was this one guy who was, he was, he gave the best audition for the lead role of the kid, but the kid is 17 years old in the movie. Yeah. This guy was in his late twenties and he looked it, he did not look like a teenager, you know? Yeah. Um, so, and then you don't know of, of backstage putting like one of our major investors wanted us to give his bartender a role. <laughs> like his, his, this bar he hung out as this guy was an aspiring actor. Luckily yeah. the guy was a really good dude and he was a good actor. Uh. So, but that happens, you know, you got to give my girl and I've seen this happen. My girlfriend, you got to put my girlfriend in this. Part. I'll give you, 
I'll give you two million dollars on making this movie, but you got to put my girlfriend in that part. That part, you know. And it was somebody who, and this was a friend of mine produced this movie. Yeah. It was a scary movie that he shot here in L.A. This woman couldn't act to save her life. Um, was so, it editing? <laughs> um, you know, no, she's still terrible in the movie. Well, the movie <laughs> wasn't good anyway. Okay. Um, but but you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. So I looked at early on, I still left audition. I auditioned about half the time, yeah. you know, but now it's pretty much self tapes with where I'm sitting right here right now. Yeah. But I still, I get offers, you know, so, but I still do have to audition. Yeah. Um, but early on, I thought of every audition is a chance to plant a seed. Like I may, if I, and I control nothing except from the time I walk in that door and those two or three minutes that I have in the room, I control that focuses on me and then you leave yeah. and, and you might not get the part, but if you do, if you do good, if you do well, it plants a seed. I ju was just listening to a podcast. My friend, David Desmalchin. Oh yes. It, uh, He's been actually, here. We love, we love David. Oh, David's done it. Well, he was on Roger Deakins. It just posted this morning, Roger Deakins uh, podcast. And he was talking about Batman, his very first movie. And I didn't, I didn't know this. I mean, I knew about him doing Batman and I knew about his recovery, you know, and everything. But when he first auditioned for Batman, it was for a one-line role, one line. Yeah. And he said, he went in, he goes, and I really thought, because, you know, he was a comic book nerd and it was my big chance. And he said, John Papsidera, the casting director from here in LA, this was in Chicago. Yeah. He said, John gave me the best advice I've ever been given. He said, take all of that, all of that energy and, and these movements and stuff. He said, take all that and put it right here behind your eyes. And I want you to come back here Monday. So David said, I spent all weekend, you know, internalizing all of this work that he had put in because he knew the Batman comics. Yeah. He knew like, and he came up with this character came from this line of the story, blah, blah, blah. So he said he went in. And he auditioned and, and with Chris Nolan and Chris was like, that was excellent. So he thinks, well, he didn't get it. So he said he completely deflated and beaten up, you know, right. and then weeks, weeks later, he gets a call. Uh, Chris wants to cast you in a much larger part. You're going to be the Joker's henchman um, in this section. So that's how David got. And then he pops, you know, because again, he was a raw nerd. Yeah. Um, the life that his life had been for the last few years, you know, yeah. and it showed up on screen. And David is just, he's a wonderful person oh, yeah. um, and very talented. So that there, that shows you at first, it was no, he, he put all this work and all this hope into this and then it turned around. So sometimes they turn around and sometimes they don't. Yeah. But you just have to, you cannot take it personally. Um. Yeah. So, you, and, and you have to have a life beyond, um, this is years ago. Yeah. I went to school with John, John C. Riley. Uh, we went to this, he was there. We overlapped by a year at the same theater school. Mm -hmm. And we were on a panel, a Q and a for the kids that were graduating that year. And I was the guy, I read the trades every day. I couldn't afford to subscribe to variety and Hollywood reporter then, but I would get the Thursday international edition of the Hollywood reporter that would list everything in production. And I would scour like, oh, I've worked with that producer before and jot it down. Okay, who's casting this? And I'd try to find all the information. And then I would press my agent. I said, look, I've worked with this producer on such and such. I saw this and I kept a card file. Yeah. Every casting person that I met, I kept track of, you know, when I met them. So I'd say, and I, I auditioned for this casting director for such and such project, really pushed to get me in. Well, Half the work that I got in the early part of my career, I got because of my legwork, because right. of me pushing. So we're in this Q&A. And I'm still, this is, uh, oh, Scream. This was late 90s. Like, John's career was doing really well, but he hadn't catapulted. You know, this was before Talladega Nights, and, you know, made him a top of the, cha move, the chain. Um, but But he said, you know, he goes, you can't put all your eggs in one basket. I mean, I see these actors, they're reading the trades, they're keeping track of, and, and, and I was offended because I'm sitting there thinking, I am that guy, you know? Yeah. You got lucky on your first gig that something happened, another actor who had a drug and alcohol problem got fired and they moved John up into his role. Wow. 
right. from a day player role. And John knocked it. I t- John's incredibly talented. He was in school. Right. But that's how I saw what he said then, you know, and I was offended by it. Well, then as the years passed, I began to see that's not what he meant. Um, and I began to understand it. it. You have to have a life outside of that. Your entire sense of self can't be, oh, I've got to get a part in this movie. I, I've got to get this audition. You know, and you become obsessive on those things and you don't have anything else going on in your own life. That's a recipe for misery. Mm. You know, I, I I don't know that I have my daughter. I, di- I didn't have my daughter by the time, you know, that Q&A happened. But I've been married since I got out of school. We've been together for 40 years. Um, so, you know, I do have a life outside of business. So I, I, I looking back, that's not because John was married at that point. I don't know if he had his kids. Yeah. But his point was, you, you got to have a your in, your entire sense of self and your entire sense of your life cannot be dependent on because that's all out of you. That's all your ego. I learned this. I learned this working with David Milch because he was talking about because I worked on the writing staff at Deadwood. Right. Was that no? Was that one of your first writing gigs? Um, it was the first time I got paid to do it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I had written the first draft of what g- became the movie Bloodworth that I produced in two thousand and nine. I wrote right then, and David had read it. That's kind of what got me in the writer's trailer. But what David said, he goes, you know, when you're creating characters, you have to understand every action, your motivation, it comes out of either a place of fear or of faith you know well i look at that like it's my spirit or it's my ego and my ego is of this world it's damn ain't i something i'm a movie star yeah Uh, that's right go look at me on the silver screen what serves your spirit is when you know uh, i got this letter from a kid after the the last of us video game came out Yeah. yeah And it was it was through social media sometime, but he wrote me this wonderful letter. And and he said that um, he said, I grew up, I, I mean, he was a teenager, but he was like 18 or 19. He said, I'm a gay gamer. And he said, I never fit in with the gamers because I was queer. I never fit in with the gay guys because I'm a gaming nerd. And he said, when I saw Bill in that game for the first time, I saw myself. Uh. I saw my life. And that fed my spirit far more than anything could feed my ego. Yeah. So that's why I say, you know, to have a career, it takes ego. You've got to push. You've got to, I deserve to be up on that big screen. You've got to think that, you know, yeah. and, but, but you also cannot lose touch of the fact that these stories that we, we are blessed to tell um, these, these, these thoughts and these ideas that we put out in the world with our stories can have a true genuine effect on the lives of other people. And, and, you know, it's possible that your ego can strangle your spirit. I mean, I, I, I know numerous people who genuine artists who get a little taste of money and a little taste of, of the ego getting blown up. And then they lose touch of um, what truly motivated me to do this in the first place. And I think, you know, Dust Malt, you know, say the same thing. It was a way with my dealing with my own issues, my own spiritual, psychological issues. This gave me an outlet to express myself. Yeah. So, so it's still, it's a constant juggle of me trying to keep those things in balance. So, yeah. Thank you for that. That I, I, I'm, it, it's so important and it's, it, it's something that's going to sink in with everybody who uh, who doesn't have that because so many people in this business seem like they are about got to get it, got to get it. And they, mm-hmm. they lose their life to just that. And mm-hmm. they don't take that breath, that time to experience their own life. Um, we, uh, you, you, I have questions. We could do a three hour interview here, but I want to bring on a few people who who have been wanting to ask questions. The first one is uh, the actress that I've known for tw- over 20 years, Shannon Direx. Shannon. Hey. Hi, I do, Shannon. I do have a question for you. Mm-hmm. What is your favorite scene from Deadwood the movie? Oh, well, the scene with Jerry and Al at the end when Al is passing. 
um, that was um, just filming the scene in and of itself. Because uh, Jerry was, her health was really poor at that point. You know, she's since gotten a lot better, but she had just had a surgery and she was in terrible physical pain yeah. uh, doing, doing the scene. And she accidentally fell off the bed <sighs> in one take. And it, it was every single person there, cast, crew, everybody wanted to grab Jerry to help her. Um, that imbued that entire scene. And that scene in itself is about Al accepting his own death. I mean, it's left up to to the viewer. Did Al pass or not? Because you never sh they never showed it, the end result. But but it was David Milch dealing with his own health issues that were starting to affect him seriously at that point, um, coupled with Jerry's experience. So it was um, it was a very moving human moment. So I think that's the one that'll never leave me from the movie. Um, the whole time, I mean, I just felt blessed every day on the movie just to be back there with those people. So, you know, there, uh, uh, this goes to another an earlier thing that, that David had asked. Yeah. There's a songwriter, Ray Wiley Hubbard, who wrote this song, and there's a line in it that says, every day that my gratitude is higher than my expectation, I have a good day. And I was overflowing with gratitude for the entire time on that movie. But to answer your question specifically, it was that final scene. Oh, Shannon, thank you. You just like open that door. <laughs> thank you. Oh, um, by the way, since you brought up Jerry, she she wanted to be here today, but and she couldn't, but she wanted to send her. Uh, love to you and say that you are just an amazing beautiful person and uh, she, yeah so um let's see we have we have a few other people here that um let's do is mark there mark let's see i've got to get a few people here um oh pam pam Here's Pam Raoka. Pam's been hi, David. Hi, she's been with Performing Arts Studio West for what 30, 25 years now, huh? No, well, no, for the while, I've been since when out 1998. There you go. Wow. So Pam, what what question do you have today? Um, what's his name that, that was in Dagwood? Um did you like working with that uh, character in Dag uh, Deadwood? Are you talking about Ian McShane, who played Al Swearingen? Yeah, Earl Brown. Hi, I'm Pam Ruka. Hi, Pam. How are you? I'm fine. I've been on Seventh Heaven. I like it set. <laughs> I want to ask what? you: Do you like working with a character in Deadwood? Uh, the character I played. Yeah. Do you like work with the character, yeah. another character? Um, yeah, I, I liked working with everybody on that show. And, and there wasn't a bad person on it because anybody that was difficult, that was mean or spiteful, David got rid of them. <laughs> you know, they, they were written off the show. I'm not going to go into specific stories, but there are a few specific stories of characters who disappeared and they disappeared for a reason. Right. Um, but everybody on that show were, Sean Bridger said it in our second season, Sean played Johnny Burns. And Sean had been like, Sean was an all-state football player in high school. He was always really successful at everything he did. Sean said, man, last year, I, I didn't have much to do. And I thought, I'm batting ninth in the order, you know, using a baseball analogy. And he said, I've never batted ninth in the order of anything I've ever done. But then I watched it and I realized, yeah, I'm batting ninth in the order on the 1927 Yankees, which is the greatest baseball team to ever play ball. And it was like that. Every single person was at the top of their game. They were extraordinary actors, you know, and then David tailored uh, so much of it to the individual people. I mean, I think, you know, the story with Jerry, he ran into her, he was in development on the show and he ran into her at the drugstore and he had this idea of, I'm going to create this character. And, and it, she gave him the idea simply by being herself. You know, I love it because she tells this joke. I know you probably heard it, but when he said, I'm, I'm David Milch, I'm doing a Western. Would you like to be on a Western? And she says, I looked at him and I said, it might surprise you, but 
I'm not really good on a horse. <laughs> <laughs> I love that one. That is great. Oh my god. So hey. so yes, everybody on the show. It was it was a blessing, and I still feel blessed to have been a part of it. Now that we are, gosh, we're 17 years removed yeah. from um, you know wrapping it up that third season. Well, and thank you, Pam, for that question. You, and the, you know what's so great too is it is a show that is timeless because again, mm -hmm. like I said, I just watched it this last week with my brother or this last month, we binge watched it. And then I found out another friend of mine said, I just started watching Deadwood and it's like amazing. I said, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. So it's, it really, it really is. I mean, uh, uh, let's call on one other person here. Luke Zimmerman, Luke Zimmerman, how are you? Hey, how you doing? Good, hey, good. Luke. Here's a question to you. Uh, mm -hmm. How it is to play Kenny, the cameraman, on screen? It's like they want to, you know, kill the cameraman. Yes, kill the cameraman. Like, how it is to be killed doing that film screen? Yeah, well, that movie, when we made it, nobody was really a big movie star except for yeah. Drew. You know, she she uh, was the only person that was well known. And then, you know, she gets killed off in the first scene. So it was a lot of fun, Luke. <laughs> wow. Wow. That is, yeah, that's, it's it's interesting to go back to all all those different different moments of, of, of the career. What, what are you most proud of in your life? My family, my daughter, my wife. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the true reward. I, um, and I, I, and I tell this story, I think if someone is genuine and they give of themselves from their spirit, um, I, I think karmically we get paid back and I'll use as an example, yeah. um, right here next to me is a roll top desk. Um, Ooh. you see, yeah. And that is, that was my, my wife's grandfather's roll top desk. Yeah. Now, again, my wife, like me grew up in a blue collar family, rural Kentucky. We're from the same County, but as a little girl, she used to play office at that desk. When she would go to her grandfather's house, she would pretend to have phone calls. She had an old briefcase of his, that was her briefcase. Yeah. And she would have meetings and she would play. And she dreamt of, she wanted to be a vice president of some big company. And I asked her once years later, I said, what, we're from farming land in Kentucky. Where did you think you were going to meet? She went, Earl, I was seven. I didn't put that much forethought into it. Ah. But she, uh, uh, when our daughter was born in 1998, Carrie didn't want to work full time anymore. She wanted to be a mom. And luckily, th this was after Scream and Mary. So things are going pretty well for me. I worked relatively steady and made <laughs> decent money. So uh, Carrie, she freelanced. So um, my wife has, I have an ability she lacks. I have an ability to sit on my ass and not do anything all day long and be fine with it. Not her, she is busy. So she volunteered for everything. All the PTA fundraisers. She was the chair of the Arts for All Council for arts education funding. Uh, she was the choir mom. The show Glee shot their pilot at my kid's high school. My kid was in middle school when this happened. But show, competitive show choir is a big, big deal at Burroughs High School. So Carrie was the choir mom. Well, yeah. through all of her volunteer work, she got to know some of the folks at Disney. Mm -hmm. And to make a very long story short, uh, our daughter was in college. Uh, she was a sophomore at University of Oregon. And Carrie got a call from Disney. And they recruited her to come work for them. And two and a half years ago, she was made a vice president. So she is a vice president at the Walt Disney Company. And so, as I, again, I say that to, that was her childhood dream, Yeah, you know, and she was on a path pursuing it until she had something more important. And that was our daughter, yeah. you know, being a mother was more important. Well, she did her job. Our daughter was grown, you know, and midway through college and her dream came back around to her. So, you know, I love telling that story. So I'm, I'm so proud of, of her. Um, also takes a lot of pressure off me because I don't have to worry about <laughs> making right. money anymore. Right. Um, right, right. But uh, but yeah, that's um, that that's a prime example of 
you talk about somebody who, who glows from the inside, that would be my wife. Uh, and she, she shares it and, uh, with everyone around her. So I mean, I've never met the two of you together that I can recall, but to, to hear the stories, to just see the way you talk about her and, and the way you are living your life, it just feels like this, oh, I just, one of these days, I, I know I'm <laughs> up there. I hope to meet somebody like, and have a relationship like the two of you. Mm -hmm. No. Um, I uh, uh, well, we have time for one more question, then we're gonna be wrapping this up today. Even though I like stay on for hours, uh, how about Savan? Savan, uh, how are you? I'm good. Hi, Savan. Hi. Um, I have a question. When when you were talking about um the word dialect, I didn't know um what that word meant. Oh, it dialect. Yeah. It's, well, a, a dialect is like um, the way certain words sound, the way they're pronounced, or the certain words that we use. It's kind of like the environment that you grew up in. Like I grew up down south, where everybody talked. It was a slower, and and uh, the vowel sounds were different. Um, and then Chicago has a very distinct, but it's all the 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 background of the people that live there. Um, right. So now an accent is something like if you speak another language, like if your main language is French and you're speaking English, certain words sound differently because you're used to, well, that's an accent because you're speaking another language. But a dialect is just, it. we all speak English, but depending on where we're from and the environments that we're around, we learn it a little differently. We hear it a little differently. We speak it differently. So, and that was the toughest thing when I was in theater school. Um, I, I was concerned about all the dance and movement stuff we had to do, you know, and um, that actually came much easier to me than the speech because I didn't even hear it. I didn't hear these certain sounds that I was making that were so distinctly Southern. So to be able to be an actor who plays all kinds of different roles, you know, from different parts of the country and everything, you, you kind of have to, um, adjust your ear. So, so that's what a dialect is. Okay. And, and, and for me, some of them are easy to do and some of them are difficult. I did a movie in Boston and, and they wanted a Boston South Sider dialect. And I had to work really hard to get that one down because mm. it was different from what I was used to. And it still takes work. It's still not easy for me to slip into that one, but yeah, but that's what it is. Where, where yeah. are you? Are you, are you from California? You from yeah, Southern um, California? I'm in between the the southern to the northern California, but um, my family it used to live in Boston. Oh, oh, well, there you go. So, but yeah, so m most people in California kind of have a standard American dialect, you know. But uh, but that's it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Savan. You're welcome. Um, I hope you're still performing music in clubs or uh, we since covid yeah um uh to, you know two of our band members they're they're in their early mid 70s uh, and both have had health issues so in covid we could we never got together we have not we had started playing a monthly residency before covid happened um and then since then we we finished a record during covid oh good we actually there it's on spotify it's on the streaming services what's it what's the name of it it's called see sacred cowboys okay. sacred cowboys is the the band and we made a couple of videos that we got shot before covid hit okay uh, but we edited them and finished them you can find those on youtube there's three of them right um and uh so we we keep talking about it but I've been since COVID I, as an actor. I spent five months in Toronto yeah. in the in spring summer of twenty one, right. and then I spent that fall. I spent two months in Brooklyn, and then COVID happened. So from November to March, and then um, so uh, moral of the story is I've been working all over the place. And uh, I, we didn't even touch on the Mandalorian. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's so That's much here. That's here in LA, Mandalorian and Book of Boba Fett. I shot those here. Oh, so uh, there might be more. You might be seeing more of Conti down the road, but that's not, not a done deal yet. Got it. So. 
what what do you want the most at this moment in your life oh i'm pretty damn well satisfied with my life as it is yeah. i mean i i want i want to continue and i've always wanted that i want to continue doing work that matters to me yeah. that that moves me rewards me spiritually now conversely you know i want my ego rewarded when when, when that that special work does well yeah. but that's really the motivating factor and that's the plus with with my wife's success you know um i i don't have to go do something if i don't want to do it right. so so yeah um you know i i did not and it's probably for the best. I didn't actively pursue fame because again, I just thought that's a byproduct of something that does well. You know, that's part of the reward um, and things that go with it. Um, well, you know, the whole circumstance I don't, with The Last of Us, I didn't get the part that I created, yeah. you know? Um, and that, that, that hurts. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, I, I want to get to a point that I'm given those parts because I'm well known enough. Yeah. Um, is it worth sacrificing um, anything else in my life for? No. So I'm pretty happy with my life. I'd like to have just a smidgen more success. So I'm in a place, my kid's grown. She's on her own. She's got a job. She's getting married this year and my wife's got a great career. So I, well, focus on that. I call that success. <laughs> oh yeah, it is. Back to the fold. 